Yes, ma'am. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I, it's, it's not often that I use the Google platform, so I just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Thank you all for coming and thank you for accommodating my timing request today. It was a very tight day, it still is a very tight day. Um, I thought I would start with, since what I understood is it's a large number of undergraduate students here, is to think about what are the approaches that we use to solve science questions. So we often ask the question why we study something or why that is interesting. But really the bread and butter of a scientist is how we study something, which includes using appropriate techniques done with appropriate controls. And finally, we come to the point of what have we actually understood? So in my lab, we look at the nervous system using the model organism called C. elegans. It's a little soil dealing nematode which eats fruits for its life. And the reason I find studying the nervous system very exciting is frankly because it's so pretty. I mean, here the brain is made of wired circuits, and this is a particularly lovely picture of neurons in the vertebrate brain. And I think for every person who's gone through school, sometime well before 10th standard and some people leave biology, we all learn about the reflex arc. Where if, and we all have an everyday experience of it, where if we hit an elbow or a finger or a knee, we withdraw immediately from the pain. And that depends on the sensory uh, circuit which runs through sensory motor circuit that runs through the spinal cord. So essentially what the nervous system does is to sense information, integrate that information, and transmit that information outside to, you know, to respond to it. So for instance, if we smell something disgusting, we may close our nose, and if we smell a beautiful flower, we may put our face closer to it, or if you feel pain, you withdraw from it, right? And so these are all the outputs of the sensing and the integration. So when you think about neurons and you think about circuits, it's certainly very exciting to understand what these circuits do, but the substrate which depends on this entire circuit functioning is individual neurons which connect between cells. Right. In this case, a muscle and another neuron here between a neuron and another neuron. And finally, between a neuron and as have an output in the muscle. So if you sort of people started getting interested in what happens inside axons post Ramonic heart, in part motivated by World War II injuries. What happened in World War II is that air-based bombardment of cities really took off cities, bridges, other military installations. And you had a lot of young men getting into these machines, these flying machines to bomb things. And you had anti-aircraft fire, which could bring these planes down. So you had a lot of young Excuse me, Yes. Um, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your slides are not moving. I'm not moving anything right oh, now. Sorry, for, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so the issue then becomes, um, you have these horrific injuries, spinal injuries typically, where people do not, so you could set the bones, you can put things together, but you will still lose your ability to control your lower limbs and people were cut off the prime of life. And people recognize that these axons, which I'm pointing here, are actually very important. And they did not seem to regrow after injury. So that led to a series of rather beautiful experiments done by Paul Weiss in University of Chicago, where he tied the nervous system, tied neurons in various model systems, you know, rabbit, cat, with the ligature for over a period of several weeks. So he didn't cut it off. He just squeezed it like a garden hose, a flexible garden hose. And as you imagine, if you have a tap with a flexible hose connected and you sort of squeeze it, you will get a little swelling 
because you have the tap connected to uh, to an outlet uh, and so you let that water in the water keeps flowing and you get this ballooning and what he saw was that you got ballooning on both sides of the ligature telling you that material was moving from the cell body to the synapse indicated here in ns as well as from the synapse back to the cell body so what happens inside these wires is flow you have flow of material taking place long past after that couple of decades actually more than maybe a couple of decades people sort of came to realize that molecular motors were critical and here is an axoplasmic breath which comes from the squid axoplasm which is a very large giant neuron and you sort of squeeze out all the cytoplasm from it and lay it on a slide and you can see that there are many organelles which are moving. Here is a little vesicle which is moving. Here's a mitochondria which is wiggling around, right? And that's another, probably a mitochondria or endosomal vesicles. So you knew that there were things inside the axon which were moving around. So what has we have learned since that time is transport of cargo in axons known as axonal transport is an essential multi-step process where you make cargo largely in the cell body you make very little because protein synthesis largely takes place in the cell body and very little in the axon and the synapse this attaches with molecular motors in this case i'm giving you an illustration of of a synaptic vesicle motor moves along microtubule tracks hops off pops back on, comes to the synapse, gets docked, releases neurotransmitter, and then you have the retrograde pathway going again. So essentially, the movement of molecular motors takes place on roads called microtubule tracks. And what I will show you next is this very nice image where you have microtubule tracks, which are these long thread-like things, and you see cargo moving along them. You see all of these things moving along them. And this is very similar in some ways to road traffic that we see on you know, any place in the world, which is you have these roads. In this case, I know the roads seem to bend a little bit, but in neurons, they don't tend to, they don't tend to wiggle around as much because of the plasma membrane and cargo moves along it, right? And in fact, if you look inside neurons, what you see is this incredibly cytoskeletally rich environment. Can I ask you if you can see my arrowhead? Sorry, ma'am, we are not able to see your slides, ma'am. It is still in the first slide. Oh, I, it's still in the first slide. Yes, ma'am. I don't know what to do. Now do you see it? Yes, ma'am. It shows cargo move in cytoskeleton rich environment in axons. You mean you didn't see any of the slides from the first slides? No, ma'am. How about now? Now it is first slide. Now the second? No, ma'am. That's very strange. Yes, now it is showing approach to solve science questions. Well, let's try something. Okay. I'm not sure why it doesn't work. Mom, you have to put on. Do you see that now? Yes, ma'am. OK. I didn't realize none of them you saw. So this is with the slide where I show that brain is made of wired circuits. This is where I talked about sense integrated transmit. And here's where I talked about the World War II injuries and what happens with the ligation experiment. Can you see my slides now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. Where you can see this ballooning on both sides and that there was flow. This was to show videos showing if you just took out the squid axoplasm, that is you remove the plasma membrane around the axon, you saw things moving around. 
And then I had a little description, a schematic of how cargo moves along microtubule tracks and releases neurotransmitter at synapses. And then I was just at this slide showing you that you can see microtubule tracks microscopically and cargo flowing. And this was very, very similar to what you see with road traffic. Do you now see my slides as well as my arrow? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So what I wanted to show, oh, sorry, that cargo moved in cytoskeletally rich environments where you see vesicles, mitochondria, and you have microtubule cytoskeleton, which is here. In fact, these are molecular motors. But you also have other kinds of cytoskeleton. So the axon, which is very narrow and thin, and if any of you have done any cockroach dissections or earthworm dissection and looked at nerves, you know that they're very thin and geometrically and you know very small. You see that they're very crowded with uh, cytoskeletal elements. In fact, you can have actin. Here you have a cross section with the C. elegans neuron of an electromicrograph, seeing showing you a lot of different microtubules and in fact cargo like vesicles which are like around two, you know 40 50 microns it will be hard pressed to squeeze their way between the plasma membrane and this microtubule bundle in addition you have actin rich regions in neurons and spectrin based actin rich regions which have been discovered by Zhuo Wang Wang in uh, in uh, at MIT and has also been discovered in C. elegans, where you see this actin periodic cells, the cytoskeleton, which also can contribute to cytoskeletal crowding. So the very simple question that we ask is, are there constraints on cargo flux in an axon? Because you're looking at a very, very crowded place. And so we come to the second part of my talk in saying, OK, I sort of gave you a justification of why we wanted to study the nervous system, why particularly axons, what was relevant about it, both from the interesting cell biological perspective that you have in understanding how neurons function, but also in terms of injury and disease. So how do you study? In the case of C. elegans, you can study it by marking the cargo, that is the elements that move, and here is a worm in which we have marked synaptic vesicles and these are the these are the synapses made by two neurons and here's another three neurons which make synapses in the brain of the worm and this is along the ventral cord or something similar what would be considered similar to the spinal cord so you can take a worm look at it under a stereo fluorescent microscope and be able to see these synaptic vesicles our approach generally has been a combination of doing a lot of genetic analysis because C. elegans is a genetic model system. The second thing that we do is a lot of live imaging where we track cargo movement in neurons and I will show you several examples. And finally, we take several interdisciplinary approaches, for instance, modeling cargo motion or we develop small tools like microfluidic devices or new labeling technologies to sort of dissect the problem of subcellular movement of cargo, both looking at both cargo formation and cargo distribution. So here's a movie which I'm going to show you of the synaptic vesicle marker, which I showed you earlier, which was concentrated in the synapse. Here I'm going to show it to you in the axon. And this is in a microfluidic device that we developed in our lab. We track the entire C. elegans worm, which is transparent. And we can get a wealth of quantitative data. So here you see cargo moving to the synapse, cargo moving away from the synapse, and you also see a lot of cargo that doesn't move at all. I sort of briefly stop here and talk about what, uh, you know, we have these kinds of movies, and actually I went and showed it to Gautam Menon, who's a theoretical physicist, and I wanted some questions answered as to why flow was different in different parts of the neurons. And each time he would look at these movies and he would look at what we call chymographs, which are just displacement time plots, 
where a sloped line indicates a moving vesicle either to the synapse or away from the synapse. And vesicles that don't move are stationary. And they look like straight lines in these graphical representation of these movies. And he would ask me every time, OK, what is this prominent things which are stationary? And I said, oh, everybody sees them. They have seen them forever. In fact, the old movies that I showed you, you could see things which wiggled around a little bit and didn't really go anywhere. So he said, this is known for kingdom come. You know, probably the microtubule is an end. Probably there's, you know, some other things which are just stuck there. Who knows? But we don't pay attention to it. After about the 10th or 15th time he asked me, it made sense that we actually look at it. I said that, are these arising due to crowded geometries? What is the role of these stationary cargo? So we started off asking very simple phenomenological questions. Where do cargo pile up? And what we saw was that there were regions where the cargo piled up, like, like so. And there will be regions where these cargos will disperse and move away. Like this, this is not a great example, but you certainly see some cargoes dispersing from it. But the next set of cargo will come and get stuck in the same place. And in 60% of the cases, we saw that they would reform at the same location. I suggested that underlying in the axon, there might be some features which lead to cargo getting trapped. And then we decided to look at cytoskeletal features driven by these sort of beautiful images that we saw of periodic actin cytoskeleton and microtubules and whatnot. So when we do, we actually now start imaging both actin as well as cargo, which is a membranous vesicular bound cargo. And here is an example where you can see an actin rich region. And this actin rich region also has vesicles trapped over there. And in fact, we looked at different types of cargos. Here we look at synaptic vesicles. Here we look at endosome. We look at mitochondria. And in Drosophila, we look at an endosome marker. We use different markers for actin, like a fragment of uh, the calponin homology domain of eutrophin or coronin or life hack. And in each case, we see that stationary cargo are present at actin rich regions. It does not matter which marker you use, it does not matter which cargo you look at, and it does not matter whether you're looking at new neurons in C. elegans or neurons in Drosophila. So this leads to a prediction. One could be that they're just present together because they're present together, so it's no big deal. The second is this kind of localization at actin rich regions is actually causal or a consequence of stalled vesicles. The way to test that is to actually have, we came up with a prediction that altering the cytoskeleton acutely could very well change the density of stationary cargo. And in fact, that's what we saw. And Kausalya first did this experiment, followed by Parul, my student. What she saw was as you inject latrunculin, which sort of dissolves actin, either in C. elegans or in Drosophila, you see a 30% reduction in stationary cargo concomitant with a similar reduction in actin rich regions. Then the reviewer of the paper asked us something which turned out to be a really good idea to do, which was, if you sort of remove the actin rich regions, does that mean that now the vesicles that would have stalled in these regions keep moving? Does that mean that the fraction of moving vesicles increases in comparison to the number of stationary vesicles? Or is it doing something else that the number of vesicles themselves reduce in some mysterious way that we do not know? And in fact, what we saw was very supportive of the idea that when you treat with latrunculin and remove actin, the fraction of vesicles that moved actually increased. This led us to consider the hypothesis that actin-rich regions could act as traps and stall cargo movement. And in their absence, many more vesicles moved. So then Parul decided to ask this very nice question is what do moving cargo do when they encounter a stall cargo? Do they act as traffic jabs? So to answer this question, she 
she and before that Kausalya actually looked at multiple things. So one, if you think that these cargo can act as traffic jams, and if you're at all similar to Indian roads where you're constrained, then a given cargo can stall at any given cargo, right? Because a car can stall behind a truck, a truck can call behind a stall, a car, a motorcycle might be able to weave through, but certainly, and even an auto rickshaw will have a hard time getting past a truck, right? So is that what we see? And that's, in fact, we see that RAP3 stall where other RAP3 are, Synapto Bremen, which is another marker stall. It doesn't matter which neuron we look at, doesn't matter whether we look at axons or dendrines, and doesn't matter whether we look at Drosophila or not, whether we look at endosomal marker. So all cargo stall predominantly near a stationary vesicle. And that's really critical to keep in mind. That is, you don't stall anyway, you stall where there is a pre-existing traffic jam or stall. So then Parul asked, what leads to the greatest number of stalled vesicles, keeping in mind the actin enrichment? What she saw was that if there was no actin enrichment and there were vesicles moving in the region, 95% would just go through, very few would stop. When there was actin enrichment, you still majority of the vesicles would go through, suggesting that actin is not acting like a trap. This was then a very telling experiment where you had stalled vesicles, but no actin enrichment, you still saw a huge reduction in the number of vesicles that go through. That suggested that just physical crowding or space occupation by a given vesicle can stall cargo that go through. And finally, if you had an actin enrichment with a stalled vesicle, making it a very crowded, narrow, you know, bazaar lane with all kinds of people sitting on the side and selling things. Eighth cross, Malleshwaram comes to mind, or seventh cross, one of those two very busy, crowded lanes. And there you have actin with all the roadside sellers, and you have a large vesicle, say a car which is in the way, and you find that nothing can get past and very little goes past. And this is the same thing that we see in Drosophila. This suggested to us that physical crowding can induce a traffic jam. And that if you have a physically blocking cargo in the way, other cargo that come do not have an easy time going past. And here is an example of that. Here is an actin-rich region in green, and red is a vesicle that comes through. And what you will see, and I'll play it again here, is it'll come here and stop. Do you see the movie? Are you able to yes. see the movie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let me play that once more. This is an example of how you see stalling taking place. You have a vesicle that comes, stops at an actin rich region. This is one of those rarer examples, but shows a very nice sort of symmetry. And here you can probably see a vesicle that comes and stops at a pre-existing vesicle. And then going back and forth, so on and so forth. Okay. So this leads to a couple of different predictions. If you think that physical crowding is a component that leads to stalling, then multiple cargo should stall together. Is that what we see? And the answer is yes. We have cargo one, cargo two, they both stall together. Here is quantitation of that, where you can look at synaptic vesicles and, and an endosome in C. elegans. You look at endosome and synaptic vesicles in Drosophila axon, you see overlap stalling of both. And in fact, if you look at mitochondria, which are very large cargo, you always have stationary uh, vesicles right beside them. This also means that if you have moving cargo, they should stop at heterotypic cargo, that they should not carry what is there in front of you. And that's exactly what we see. It doesn't matter whether there's a truck in front of you or a car in front of you, you will stop. So a mitochondria will, a, 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 a synaptic vesicle will stop at mitochondria, an endosomal vesicle will stop at synaptic vesicles. Whether they are going to the synapse in the anterograde direction or away from the synapse, which is in the retrograde direction. So you're insensitive in a sense for the phenomenon, for the kind of motor that is present on your cargo surface. 
The second prediction is if you have physically crowded regions, then they should control local flux or local cargo flow. If you're in a region which Google Maps shows yellow, you know that individually each car is not going to go very far. It might go a little distance and it will stop again. So does that happen? And in fact, this was Parul's idea again, who was the student who was doing this work. What she saw was that if there was stalled vesicle and that stalled vesicle moved, the number of vesicles that flowed through that direction, it didn't matter which direction of movement, just increased when the traffic congestion cleared. Suggesting strongly that local flux regulations occurs at locations where cargo are stalled. The third prediction is how far a vesicle can travel should depend on the density of stationary cargo. If there are many stalled vehicles on a road, then an individual moving vehicle will not go very far. Whereas if there are few stalled vesicles, then or few stalled vehicles on a road, then an individual vehicle will go quite far. And that's indeed what we see as the local density of stationary cargo increases, how far a vesicle move decreases. And that's what we mean by run lengths or the distance of cargo movement. It, and that depends on the local density of stationary cargo. So this is all fine. These are all suggesting that neurons are like Indian roads and they are crowded and things need to move there. But there are other questions you can ask. So they're just rising from physical properties. Are stationary vesicles functional reservoirs? And we did that experiment by doing what is a gentle touch assay where you touch the animal and it responds and it's like an escape response that we talked about when we bang our knee. You can do it with an eyelash or you can do it by putting it through a pillar device which is the way of wearing armor, I say, or chain mail and the animal is stimulated in lots of places. It does not matter, and this is a microfluidic device that we de developed again in collaboration with Venkat's lab in ISC. And what we saw in both cases was whether you touch them with an eyelash, either 10 touches or 60 touches, or you use this pillar device, you find that the density of stationary vesicles go down after stimulation. And this is really interesting because in an axon, you have about 2,000 vesicles approximate might be a little bit less we know that because we know the number of vesicles in each stationary cargo and we know the density is about four to six uh, locations per 10 microns so we can have a rough rule of thumb back of envelope calculation about how many vesicles we have at the synapse you have only around for these collection of 11 synapses for the touch neuron you have about you know maybe 200 vesicles when you do the stimulation, you are adding something to the tune of a thousand vesicles to the axon, which is a large number of vesicles compared to what's at the synapse. So we have not figured out what the role of this is, and it's waiting for the right student to look at this particular question. So we'll move on to the why question again, right? Are traffic jams relevant in sick neurons? Because we've sort of shown, I've sort of shown you some evidence to suggest that healthy neurons have traffic jams. And there's a long history of looking at traffic jams in neurodegenerative disease, diseases like Alzheimer's or, um, you know, ALS, which is um, tip, uh, the familiar forms comes through mutation in SOD, which is superoxide dismutase. And what you see, and you know, as I said, it's also important in injury as an in axon uh, regeneration, but we won't get into that today. But I thought I would show you this very nice work, which comes from human uh, iPC-derived uh, neurons. And what you see in young animals, young, uh, young cells, you see these very nice flow of mitochondria, older people, in older cells, you don't see that. You know, it's there, but it's a little reduced. When you look at a mutation in ALS caused by a mutation in TDP43, 
you see that in young animals you do largely okay you may be like older animals but you do largely okay things are moving around but if you look at the old animals you see barely anything moving around at all so traffic jams or lack of movement is a feature of human neurodegenerative neurons and it is also a feature of mouse models and drosophila models of neurodegeneration the other issue that you see is when you look at middle-aged animals they are still happily moving around here it is c elegans but middle-aged animals which have defects in their traffic machine transport machinery as you can see over here is one example don't do so well are not able to move very well again suggesting that movement of the animal and movement of cargo inside the neuron can be sensitive to aging and to what are the underlying mutations in disease states okay so then the issue becomes if you have these traffic jams occurring in healthy neurons which is what i've showed you so far with the exception of the last movie you need to have some mechanism to get past these traffic congestions and here's where we came, Gautam Menon, who's our theoretical physics collaborator, came back with these simulations. And what he saw was the following. You have vesicles moving. And if nothing happens, everything will come to a halt, right? If you're a driver and you just come and stop behind a vehicle and you do nothing, then nothing is going to move on the road. In this case, there are one of two choices, which even as drivers on Indian roads, we will choose. One is to change the lane. And the second is to just say, okay, we're going to park on the side or go back, park on the side, do something else, come again. So when you change lane, which is shown here, which is what I call spatial relaxation of traffic congestions, or you can have a temporal relaxation of traffic congestions. That is, in this place, the number of traffic congestion stays changes with time. So it might be easier to get through that location at a different time. So if you want to look at this experimentally and not through a simulation, which already shows that either of these strategies will work to keep moving traffic moving, this is what you do. You first look at your neuron. Again, you're looking at green as an actin-rich region and red as a synaptic vesicle. And let's see what this vesicle is doing. It's going back and forth, back and forth. And we'll finally get through one actin-rich region. And here's another whopper of an actin-rich region. And it's going to go back and forth, back and forth. And that also has a vesicle, actually. It's a bit yellowish. And it finally comes through, right? So what we find is that these kind of reversals certainly occur in neurons. They occur less frequently for synaptic vesicles at stationary cargo rather than away from stationary cargo. It means that this is probably not triggered by a traffic jam, unlike human behavior, but happens in a potentially stochastic manner. And now we come to the killer experiment, which was done by Kirtana Venkatesh, a master's student in the lab where she took a Tauapathy model, that is a model which has crowding in axons, and asked, what is the reversal rate as the animal ages? Because for many of these neurodegenerative diseases, young people or young animals don't show a phenotype, middle-aged and older people do, or animals do show a phenotype. And what she sees is that in wild time, the reversals peak and then slowly begin to drop, Whereas in the Tauapathy disease model, the reversals sort of stay low throughout. What you see is the number of stationary cargo in turn also sort of stay slightly higher compared to wild type. So when you have greater reversals in wild type, you have the lowest number of stationary cargo. And the net current, that is the amount of cargo that can flow in the neuron, is sensitive to the reversal rate and to the number of stationary cargo. That shows, so what it suggests that there appears to be a relationship between reversals, how many traffic congestions or traffic jams you have, 
and the net flow of cargo in the axonal road. So what have we learned from doing this study? We've learned that traffic jams arise from axonal design features, and there is one unbreakable rule. If there is no space in front of you, you cannot go ahead. And that reversals might play key roles in allowing for maintaining cargo flow in neurons, particularly in a neurodegenerative crowded condition. And maybe in these neurodegenerative crowded conditions, the rates at which you do reversals going down is what might contribute to slowing down of traffic flow in the axon. I should give credit to the people who did the work. Kausalya, who is a postdoc, started the work. Parul was a PhD student who finished it. And the reversal work was done by Kirtana, who is, was an MSc student and lately finished up by uh, Amrita Vasudevan, another current PhD student. A major collaborator in the study was Gautam Menon, who is a theoretical physicist, who was in IMSC and now splits his time between IMSC and Ashoka University. And we got strains from a bunch of people, and this is our funding. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.